that mean to you? What's that? Choices. Anybody else? Not being bossed around. For me, when I was younger, I believed that freedom was more about doing what I wanted to do. The choices, not being pushed around, not being having, not having my choices being made for me, being free to do what I wanted when I wanted. But as I was younger, the idea was that that freedom was somewhere. It, it was another place, another time. It was after I graduated high school. It was after I moved out. It was after I got a job. It was after I had my own family. It was never here and now. It was always somewhere else. Do you ever feel like you're not free? That you're not free right here and right now, not free the way you want to be? Maybe you're you're trapped by circumstances, such as, you know, just those weird, unexpected arguments with your spouse or another loved one, where it just seems to come out of nowhere. It's like no matter what you do, you're always trapped into that, because that's just the way things go. You're not free from it. Or there's problems at work. You know, you've got those employees that you work with, your coworkers that you just never seem to be able to connect to, or you're just always trapped into dealing with them in a way that just doesn't feel good for you or healthy for you or even them. Or you've got the boss that just seems to yell at you and you're like, no matter what you do, it's never good enough. Anybody ever had that happen? Mm-hmm. Or what about customers? Ever have a customer that you were like, please, somebody else take care of this? And you feel trapped and not free to deal with the way you like? Or how about being trapped by our upbringing? How many of us have had uh, angry or an absent father or, or other parent? Or maybe we just didn't grow up with one. We were a stepchild or a foster child who didn't have any of that. Maybe we felt trapped by that because it defined who we were. Or we had physical abuse or emotional abuse that we grew up with. And we're trapped and we're not free from those things because they are who we are. And we're always wanting someday, somehow, to be set free. And there's also being trapped by our past. The choices we made, whether it be dropping out of school for some people, that was a choice that seems to have defined and created their whole world for them. Or they either married or divorced for the wrong reasons. They saw somebody that they were in love with and they figured, if I just get with this person, I will be free finally. They will be the key to my freedom. Or if I leave them, if I'm no longer married to that person, I'll finally be free. Do you ever feel trapped that way? And then there's also drugs and other addictions. Those things seem to trap people. My brother, uh, who I love very dearly, thankfully, he's been clean and sober for the past two years. But there was a time when he was literally trapped in bondage to this stuff. No matter how much he wanted to be free, it never happened. I'm kind of changing the direction just a little bit here. I want to talk to you about Daniel. Now, I know in our context here at this church, uh, Adventism, Adventism, So we hear a lot about Daniel and prophecies and everything, but that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk to you about is the world that Daniel faced. See, when Daniel grew up, Israel had been going back and forth. Uh, They'd been free from Egypt. God had settled them out in the promised land and created them as their own nation. But over time, they turned away, and they really had a bad history of being unfaithful, and they get themselves in trouble. God would take care of them. They bring back. They worship Him, and then they fall away. And interestingly enough, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And so you get to the time of Daniel, where God is just like, "Okay, uh, you've done what you wanted to. I'm going to let you do what you want." And part of the consequence is uh, you're going to be overtaken. And so during this whole time, uh, Babylon, the other nation that's nearest them, starts to rise into power and it starts taking over a lot of territory. They get into uh, battles with uh, Egypt and Assyria. Nebuchadnezzar, I don't know if many of you have heard that name, he rises up and becomes the king of Babylon. He's the one who actually conquers Egypt and Assyria, and then he sets his eyes on Jerusalem. At this point, he goes and he sieges Jerusalem and takes it over. And during that campaign, he takes away a bunch of people, and included among them is Daniel. So when Daniel's taken away, one, he goes from a country that for him is freedom. He has religious freedom for himself. He has the ability to do what he believes is right 
and necessary. He can study his uh, religion and his beliefs with no persecution whatsoever because that's Israel, that was his nation. But he's taken away into an entirely different situation where he becomes captive, he becomes forced to leave his country of origin, his home, his friends, everything that he's known, the freedoms that he's known, and he is now a prisoner. During this time, he's also forced to learn things that were contrary to what he grew up learning. The Babylonians believed in multiple gods. They believed in the ability to uh, look at the stars and tell the futures, read dreams based upon how they deal with animals and just really weird, interesting things. But that was contrary to what he was taught as a child. But he has to learn these things because he gets to go through the specialized school that the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar gives to them. He also has to serve his government of capture. This isn't just simply becoming a prisoner. This is being a prisoner and made to serve somebody else, the people that took your rights away. This is the world that Daniel lives in. He lives in a world where his freedom, for all intents and purposes, has been taken away. When we're looking at this, we have to really understand what does freedom mean. The world defines freedom as a life without any restraints. Something along the lines of, I can do anything I want, say anything I want, without anybody telling me what to do. Have you ever heard anybody define freedom that way? Everybody else get, may get burned by what you do, but you get to do it your way. As Frank Sinatra said, I did it my way. The world says you can have your freedom, but only by being totally selfish. By the normal definition of freedom, Daniel was anything but that. He was a prisoner. But everyone wants to be free. Who here does not want to be free? And no hands go up. Impressive. But as Eric Fromm said, there is no gift human beings run from faster than the terrible gift of freedom. From Fromm, in his studies that he did dealing with uh, World War II and Nazi and just what was going on over there, he suggests the gift of freedom can lead to fear over the loss of control and thereby a desire to create external restraints, much like the ones that were sought freedom from. Basically, you create your own prison. Confuse security with freedom, and along the way you'll find neither. Freedom and security are not the same by any means. And Israel found this out to be true. See, when God gave them their freedom, when he took them out of the bondage of Egypt, where they were slaves and forced to do what their masters wanted, they cried out to God, and he said, okay, I'll bring you out. And what he did is he established them something that was really unique, at least in my mind, for that time. They had no king, no central authority. It was free. They had their judges, they had the priests to help guide them in what God wanted them to do. But other than that, they didn't have a central form of government. However, they started looking around at the other nations. And you ever notice that when people start looking at the, the world outside them, they start to become dissatisfied with the way their life is or where they're at in their life? Israel did this, and they started going, hey, we want a king. So God goes in and gives them a king. And once they have this king, they start looking at, oh, this country over here, they don't like us. They don't like us. So they're going to they're gonna attack us, and we're not strong enough. So we need to talk to Egypt over here or somebody else, and we're going to make an alliance so that we can have our freedom. So we can protect our freedom, because in large numbers, that's where freedom lies. But it always ended badly for them. Do you ever think that something's going to be one way, and then once you get it, it's not what you expected at all. That was what Israel had happening when we were all with them for quite a while. So how did Daniel choose to respond to his loss of freedom, to his captivity? Well, first let's look at some of the options that Daniel could have done. What are some of the things that Daniel could have done? Now, barring what you know of Scripture, for those of you that know this stuff, if you were in this situation, what are some of the things you might have done? Run away. Ate the king's food. Ate the king's food. Just went ahead and went along with it. Mm-hmm. Said, woe is me. And I guess I'm here. I'm not going to be free if I don't know 
Freedom, freedom is based upon doing what they say. He could have resigned himself to depression. Nothing I can do about it. Eh, whatever. I'll give your sin done. He could have fought back. Demanded to change things. You know, we don't have to take this. He could have started a revolt, an uprising. You know, not gotten anywhere. But then how many times have we seen in history or even in our own lives where we'll fight against something that there's no possible way we can change it or win? He could have sought revenge. I'll make them pay. I mean, because he was being trained to, to help out the king. What better way? Get yourself in a good position as soon as it's right. You make your move. Poison, kill, you know, sword, whatever. It really didn't matter. They had a lot of ways to do it back then. He could have sought a way to destroy the government. I'll bring it down from the inside out. A gentleman in chorus said, The man is free who is self-reliant, who masters his passions, who fears neither poverty nor death, nor prison, who resists his appetites and despises worldly ambition. So what did Daniel choose to do? Well, if we take a look at Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, we get some ideas. He says, But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. And God granted Daniel favor and compassion inside the commander of the officials. What I want to point out here in this is that it says that he sought permission. So this is not a guy who is in rebellion. It's like, I'm not going to do what you say. You're going to do what I say. He's very humble. He chooses to seek a win-win situation. Going on, verse 10, he kind of outlines what he was talking to. And this is what the official comes back and says, Hey, you know, I'm afraid of my Lord and King. He's appointing me to make sure that you're taken care of. And he knows best. I want to make sure you're taken care of because, see, if you're not taken care of, I'm not taken care of. But I like my head right where it's at. Thank you very much. So I'm not too keen on this whole thing of, yeah, doing something different for you. But what Daniel says to the overseer, he talks about him and his friends. Go ahead and go on. Still, looking for a win-win situation, Daniel, please test your servants for ten days. Let's be given the vegetables and the water drink. What I want you to get from this verse here is that Daniel is still trying to work with his captors. Not working against. He's saying, hey, hey. I understand how it is. I know what it's like to be in a position of authority and have people over you and say, hey, you do it my way or there's going to be something to pay. I understand that. So let's do this. Don't just get in and switch it and then we go call it good. Let's test this. And if it doesn't work out, deal with this as you see fit. Hey, if I'm wrong, we'll go and eat what you say. Daniel was also diligent to learn all that he could. In Daniel, verse, uh, Daniel 1, verse 20. Thank you. It says, it's for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted, that he found them ten times better than all the magicians and converts who were in his realm. Who here has ever taken a college class? Okay, how many of you, if you went through that class and said, I'm not going to read more anything of what they have to say. I'm going to go at it my way. We'll be able to take the test and pass it. Mm-hmm. Pretty dumb. Do you think that Daniel and his friends were actually found ten times better because they just said, I'm not going to learn that? And do you think that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, is going to quiz them only on their knowledge, on their religion? Probably not. Daniel doesn't go, hey, that's not what I learned. That's not what I'm going to do in my life. I don't want to learn that stuff. He goes, hey, I want to make the best of it. He learned how to learn what they were teaching and filter it through his own knowledge. But he never refused. And then finally, Daniel didn't seek revenge. In Daniel 2.19, when we see that there's this vision that's going on. The king has this weird dream, wakes up, he can't understand it. He brings in his people, and he asks them, they, they just can't figure it out. So the king gets really ticked off. I mean, in fact, that time, you just didn't tell the king no. It wasn't an option. If you did, you were liable to lose your head. And that's what the king wanted to do. He wanted to kill them all. So Daniel goes out and goes, hey, I think 
that might have been the wrong version. That's okay. <laughs> anyway, what I'm getting at here is when Daniel found out about this, he didn't go, hey, these people that I'm going through school with, those Babylonians, they're responsible for my captivity. I want to see them get killed first. You know, I know I'm going to die, maybe. But hey, better them first than me. In Daniel 4.19... At this point, Nebuchadnezzar has passed away, and another ruler has come in. And it's Belshazzar. He's like uh, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. In this situation, Daniel is still, still there hanging out with him, still working with the government. There's an issue where there's something written on the wall, and he calls, Belshazzar calls for uh, Daniel. And instead of Daniel going, sucks to be you, or sit on it, I'm not going to tell you, even though he's not happy with the fact that he's being asked to do this stuff here, and the king is offering, sorry, to give him all this reward. He still reads it to him. And in Daniel 6:24, then the king gave orders. And they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel and they cast them and their children to the wives of the lion's den. And they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions were overpowered and crushed them all in all their bones. The reason I wanted to show this to you, this comes after the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Daniel is accused of uh, basically not doing what the government says. I think I have these a little bit worse, but that's fine here. I'll point it out to you. What I wanted to make sure is that you understood that Daniel sought the good of the kingdom above his own. Prior to this, the reason he was thrown in the lion's den was that they were searching for something to find him that he'd done wrong. He's got to be something wrong. And when they were trying to do this, in Daniel 6.4, it says that in regards to the government's affairs, they couldn't find any accusation against him. So here's a guy who is serving with integrity the very country that stole his freedom. Another gentleman, uh, Salvador Margara, said that a man is free who knows how to keep his own hands, the power in his own hands, the power to decide at each step the course of his own life. Do you think that that's how Daniel was approaching this? That at every step he was choosing how he would decide. See, too many people look to others and other things for their freedom. Some people look to their spouse. As I said earlier, some people will marry because they believe that's going to give them freedom. Or they'll look at their spouse in a way that says, hey, you need to fix me, which is giving them freedom in some form. Or they look to a boyfriend or girlfriend. If I had one, if they would do this for me, I would be free. Or we look to our children. Sometimes there are those who will try to live their lives through their children and that way they find freedom from the past and the choices that they made. Maybe I can correct things. Some of us look for freedom in our jobs or our finances. If I could just get that dream job, then I'll be free. And I won't have to deal with this drudgery or the finances. If I could just make this much money, then everything will be okay. And sadly, some of us look to our government. Now, I know one of the things they say, never talk about religion and politics. And I'm not here to talk about, you know, uh, Democrat, Republican, or anything. But here's my thing. From looking at Daniel, and there's others. I mean, look at the life of Joseph. He's another example. These are men that were in hostile governments to them, and they found freedom. See, freedom doesn't come from the government. The government can never give you freedom, no matter what you may think, no matter what they tell you, no matter what you believe. Freedom does not come from the country where you live. And Daniel proved that, because all of his acts were acts of a free man. So how do we find the freedom that Daniel had? How do we get free from our circumstances, our upbringing, or even our past sins? I told you at the beginning here 
that I was going to find out more about what it was like to not be free and how much I wanted freedom. When I was about, well, that's not wrong. Things really sure about that. I got wrapped up in a lot of sexual immorality, pornography, and it just kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And no matter how much I wanted to walk away from it, I was like, I could never break free. I knew it was wrong. I knew I didn't want it. And yet, I felt drawn to it. So, this went on for years. I mean, it was just nuts. Until I was about 25. I had what I would consider a relapse, and I was suggested to go see a counselor. And I started going to the counselor, and, and I don't know, anybody ever been to a counselor for the first time, and it's like you've got to spill your entire life, and you're, and it's like, you, you feel like the dog eating your vomit again. It's like, I'm going back to do this. After about the third session, I went out to my truck, and I was just tears rolling down my face. I'm like, God, why? Why do I have to go through this? And in the oddest fashion, I heard, not audibly, but just a sense, God saying, good question. Why do you? Because I freed you from this. And something started to change. I was like, oh, yeah, that starts to make sense. See, I was trapped in my prison because I wasn't accepting the freedom that I was given in Christ. See, freedom comes from Christ alone. It comes from no other source. No document, no government, no man, woman, child. No one can give you freedom but Christ. And the way we get that freedom is first, it has to be believed. You have to believe and trust what God says is true. Isaiah 61, verse 1 says this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty and cap- to captives, and freedom to the prisoners. Have you ever felt like a prisoner in your own life? I know I have. When I was going through that stuff, I felt like such a prisoner. John 20, verse 31 says, But these have been written, and this is John referring to the entire book and what he's told about the life of Christ. But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing in Him, you may have life in His name. To have life is to have freedom. You have to trust that when God says He came to free you, when Christ came to do that, He really meant to do that. And that's what I wasn't doing. When I sat out there outside the counselor's office, I realized I was not really believing and trusting. The second thing is you have to receive it. You have to receive the freedom that He gives you. And accept that freedom that Christ offers out to you freely. John 13, 20 says, Truly, truly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he receives me who receives sent me. Man, I hate that when I do that. Anybody ever done that? You get the gist though. The point is, is that Christ is saying, you have to receive me. And when you receive me, you receive everything that comes with me. And he already said that what his mission was in Luke was the same thing that he said in Isaiah, and that was to set the captives free. Galatians 4, chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, says, So that when he, Christ, might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, because you are sons. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Has anybody ever taken your child and made them captive? Would you ever make your child a prisoner? Yes. Aside from father. <laughs> <laughs> Just a joke now, between me and her. And yeah, that, that's something. But I'm talking about the people here. I believe that every father, every mother here loves their child. I know I love mine. And I would never allow them to stay a prisoner. I would never allow them to not be a prisoner. And third, our freedom... And this is what it really hit me. Our freedom needs to be lived out. The way we live out our freedom is that we make free choices at every chance we get. And that's what we see in the life of Daniel. Every moment 
of every decision that he had, he chose, instead of making a prisoner's choice, he chose a free man's choice. 1 Peter 2, verse 16 says, Act as free men. According to everything that I've read in Scripture, when Christ died on the cross, we were set free. And yet there's so many times we don't act. And here Paul is telling us that we must act as free men. And do not use our freedom as a way to cover up evil. But use it as a bond slave of God. Our freedom should serve. And the only way we can do that is each time we have a chance, we choose to make a free choice and we act upon it. Because nobody can take away our freedom but us. In Galatians 5.1. This is interesting because I keep seeing this verse all over the place. I've heard it in a couple of spots on the radio. I've seen it on uh, while I was driving down the freeway. It was, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Don't be giving in to those arguments that you have with your spouse that says, I can't win. I can't win. Make those free choices. Don't give in to the fact that you, or to the idea that you feel, I can never get past what I've done before, the choices I've made. There is freedom in Christ from that. It says, it's not bound to you to live this life. It is given to you to be free. Summarizing it, what really stood out is John chapter 8, verse 36, where Jesus talking to them says, Therefore, if the Son sets you free, you will really be free. See, that day when I was there in the truck and I was trying to figure out why I was really going back over my past again, God goes, you're free. You don't need to do this. You're not bound to this. You're free to make other choices. And even though everything didn't change to the point where it's like, oh, and no problem ever again, every time it comes up, God reminds me, you are free. Choose freedom. I know this, no matter what may come, I will be a free man every single day as long as I choose to act upon that freedom that I get through Christ. And no one else could ever take that away. It is given to me as a free gift through God and it is my choice to either use it or deny it and give it away. 